how would you frame the discussion around Alzheimer's? I think that the start of this discussion is perhaps a thread that we pull on saying most of what m- many people believe about Alzheimer's for the last 15 to 20 years is probably not very useful in treating it or reversing it or talking about how to prevent it and potentially totally wrong. That's certainly where I and numerous other people have have ended up, uh, that, that we essentially, we lumped together two fairly distinct diseases um, or disease processes and called them all Alzheimer's disease. And that has made figuring out the approach to the more common late onset uh, or sporadic Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, finding treatments for that, I think has been hindered because we've kind of lumped it in with this other disease, which is the uh, disease originally described by Alois uh, uh, Alzheimer, which is familial monogenic Alzheimer's disease. Um, it onsets in 30s, 30s to 50s. It has a very well-described homogeneous course. Um, it's much better understood, um, and it, it we know it has genetic underpinnings, which can either be passed on familiarly or can, um, it can the, the mutations can occur, can occur spontaneously, which they do in about fifty percent of cases. But you know, if if people are watching the video, then you can see the table here. This is from our recent paper: uh, the uh, the presenilin genes and amyloid precursor protein genes. These are most commonly uh, the the genes involved in early onset or classical Alzheimer's disease, um, and it was it's thought that the first case of Alzheimer's disease was maybe due to a PCN1 mutation. There was there was a paper that did did some uh, genotyping of the brain from that patient. It's been disputed since, but it's almost certain that the original description of Alzheimer's disease was due to a single mutation, you know, also autosomal dominant mutation. If you then compare that to what we in this paper called age-related dementia, which is far more common and what people have much, you know, you know, 95 plus percent of cases of Alzheimer's disease and what people um, might call late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, if there's a genetic component, it's polygenic, very, um, you know, imperfectly pen- penetrant uh, for a number of reasons that we can talk about. Very heterogeneous disease course, very heterogeneous uh, pathology. If we actually look at the brains and see what's going on in there, it looks very different from person to person. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of lifestyle factors that are important as well. It occurs much later in life. Uh, so even though if like you look at the brains of people with advanced Alzheimer's disease of both types, they may look very similar. What caused that process to sort of end up there is probably very different. And in order to tackle the real burden, which is the late onset of Alzheimer's disease, which we call age-related dementia, um, you know, I think it takes a different approach, and we should sort of just like separate it out entirely. It's it it mirrors some other discussions we've had in the past on podcasts, perhaps these LDL polymorphisms in familial hypercholesterolemia being described as markers or. Uh, model systems for atherosclerosis. But yeah, there's there's a difference here between age-related cognitive decline, age-related dementia, Alzheimer's, which is sporadic, heterogeneous mm. course, not related to any one gene that we can think of, perhaps polygenetic. Now, when we're talking about Alzheimer's, I think the gene most people will think of is APOE. Um, can we talk about that for a moment? We did a whole podcast on this, but I think that some framing around APOE 4-4 polymorphism specifically, or 3-4, uh, would be helpful for people from your perspective. Yeah. So in westernized populations, um, APOE4 is the, or, you know, having one or or more copies of, of um, APOE4 is, you know, the most important single genetic risk factor for age-related dementia, we'll call it. It contributes, a, you know, maybe up to 5% of total risk, your, your APOE4, your APOE genotype. And, you know, compared to um, those who don't have APOE4, so either 2-2s two or 3-3s three threes or 2-3s, the, the, you get an increased odds of uh, developing age-related dementia of maybe, you know, 6 to 20 fold higher, which, which is, you know, marked. However, uh, we know that depending on the scenario and the individual, APOE4 may or may not actually be a risk factor. So 
in indigenous populations, non-Westernized populations. I mean, now we have multiple um, multiple examples. I think we cited three different uh, papers in different populations in that paper that APOE4 is either not a risk factor or maybe protective in certain scenarios. So it seems like APOE4 is like, the majority of the risk comes from an interaction between that gene and the modern westernized environment. So when you when people are not in that environment, it doesn't seem to be uh, a risk factor at all. So as with most things, you know, that have a genetic component, the interaction with the environment really is critical. Um, and you could argue that, you know, maybe we don't know yet which factors in the environment are the most uh, important, but you could imagine a scenario where somebody eats a minimally processed diet, sleeps, exercises, you know, doesn't smoke, uh, is APOE4 then, you know, avoids, you know, so avoids systemic insulin resistance or, or type of diabetes or prediabetes. In that setting, is APOE4 a risk factor? I would argue probably not, or it would dramatically decrease uh, the likelihood of, of, there, of there being an issue. Uh, but, you know, sort of, I don't think there are any numbers on that yet because we're still sort of teasing that apart. So the populations that I remember you and I talked about were <clears throat> the Chimene and perhaps the Bolivian Yoruba. Um, or is there a third population that yeah, there's a there's a central uh, Central African population in Nigeria and then also indigenous uh, Americans? So, yeah, so I guess Bolivian, yeah, maybe it's yeah, the Yoruba. Interesting because I found that so interesting when we had that conversation a few years ago that in hunter gatherer or non processed food consuming westernized populations, I guess none of these populations are true hunter gatherers, that APOE4 did not have an increased risk of age-related cognitive decline or dementia and mm. perhaps was even protective in people. So I was fascinated to find the history of the APOE4 alleles and to learn that APOE4 was the ancestral genotype. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and perhaps conditions where APOE4 is even protective? Yeah, sure. So, so um, the APOE gene, APOE protein, um, obviously involved, it, it's an apolipoprotein, so it's involved in uh, lipid trafficking in the body but it's also um, associated with immune function and inflammation. And originally, as humans you know, maybe came down from the trees, for, for want of a better phrase, um, as we were exposed to uh, a new and greater number of insults, um, we, the, the original, quote-unquote, original human APOE uh, genotype was APOE4. And it, ha it, it compared to the others, which came along later, is often associated with a, a greater or heightened immune response in, in certain settings. So this is maybe beneficial when you're being exposed to a greater or, or number or, or different um, insults than you may be based on the habitat that you're uh, you know, previously evolved in. Um, and in the setting of the, the Bolivian semenate in, in particular, the, the one study where they looked at APOE4 genotype and cognitive function, it seemed to be APOE4 seemed to be protective in the setting of a high parasitic infection burden, which is common in those societies. And that's probably because of improved uh, immune function, able to sort of, you know, better respond and, and mitigate um, some, some of the issues that you might get from a systemic parasitic infection. However, um, in other settings, APOE4 can, you know, still uh, increase risk uh, of uh, worse cognitive outcomes, if you want to put it that way, uh, in the setting of traumatic brain injury, you know, it's like an acute brain injury or a stroke, or maybe even more of a chronic type brain injury, you know, associated with poor systemic health or, or lifestyle. APOE4 seems to, you know, accelerate um, or increase the, the sort of inflammatory responses into the brain to those kinds of insults. And that's maybe why it can sort of amplify um, the, the risk in the sort of the modern environment, which seems to not be particularly good uh, for, for the brain in general, that's what we're seeing uh, increasingly. 